So, if you have your Bible, open to Genesis chapter 1. We're starting a new study. <clears throat> and the series that we're going to be working on, uh, I've titled A Family Affair, not after the, the stuff that is so often in the news these days, um, kind of going back to, well, actually quite a few years ago, um, I believe that God has implemented a series of things within creation to reveal himself to us. Uh, I believe Paul writing in uh, Romans makes it very clear uh, that God has, has shown himself to us through nature. Uh, but I think one of the, the most visible expressions that God wants us to see him in is the expression of family. Okay. Um, he refers to himself as Abba, our father. He sent his son. Uh, he desires to have intimacy with us as such as would only exist, should only exist between a husband and a wife. And even beyond that, he desires more intimacy than that. Uh, and we see that in some of the teachings that Jesus gives us. So we're going to be working through... Uh, the different components that make up the family unit, and we're going to be talking about the roles that each of us plays in filling those, those particular uh, places. Now, keep in mind that you will fulfill, you will fill more than one role over the course of your lifetime. Okay? I started off not as a father or a papa, I started off as a child. And in my family, I started off as a sibling because there were already a couple before me. Uh, so we, we see the dynamic already at play. I have a mother and a father, and I have siblings. Okay? The mother and father are married, and so they are a couple. And so we see there's a dynamic at play in how this family thing operates. And I believe with all my heart that God established this so that we might learn from that more of his nature and who he is. Okay, so in looking at the family, I figured the best way to, to start this thing is to look at the beginning. Okay, so we're going to Genesis. Uh, there's a couple of passages I'm going to read, uh, one out of Genesis chapter 1 and then one out of Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to start taking a look at how God created this to be. Before we get into this, though, I have to preface everything that I'm going to say in this series is predicated not on Genesis 1 or Genesis 2, but it's tainted by Genesis 3. Okay? Because what we see as the, the functional family, well, I'm not even going to say functional. Everybody talks about dysfunctional families. I have yet to meet a functional family. <laughs> Every family I've met has their idiosyncrasies. They have their, their things that make them unique. Okay, and I hear people say all the time, oh, I came from a dysfunctional family. So did we all. That happened in Genesis 3. Okay, Genesis 3, the fall of man, made it so that every family is a dysfunctional family because none of them operates fully in, in the way that God designed and intended them to operate. Okay, so when we look at, at what Scripture has to say about the family unit and the roles that we play in that, we need to understand that sin has corrupted and warped what God designed. And so when we look at these things, we have to strip away all the things that our culture tells us, all the things that the particular burdens that our own family lives have placed on us. Uh, one of the, the greatest articles that I ever read that really opened my eyes, and I, I still struggle with this, is Keith Green wrote an article in the Last Days newsletter, and he called it The Father Heart of God. <clears throat> And he talked about how we tend to view God through the same lens that we saw our fathers. Okay? And that really hit home for me. Because I still, uh, I, I kind of stand in amazement because Christy has this incredible view of God. She has this incredibly warm, inviting presence of God where she feels like at any time she can crawl up into his lap. Okay? Okay? And, and I know Thaddeus has commented that he feels that way. Okay, I have never felt that way. Okay, and, and thank God I'm not judging him by what I feel. Okay, because if we start judging God based on how we feel, 
jeepers criminy. You're going to attribute a lot of things to God that he just doesn't have. All right? So, when sin came in, it warped everything. I talked very briefly last week in uh, Genesis chapter 3 when, when uh, the serpent deceived Eve and when Eve pro-offered the apple to Adam and he didn't do his job to husband the creation and to enforce the rule, one rule, just one. My family, we have one rule too. Okay? My family is, don't make dad angry. Everything is covered under that. Okay? And when you do something, you have to think, is this going to make my dad angry? Okay? But in the garden, there was one rule. Don't eat this fruit, the fruit from this tree. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Okay? And so we see that, that Eve was deceived by the serpent. We see that Adam took of the fruit as well. Uh, Adam did not stand up and say, hey, yo, stop. Woman, stop. Okay? He didn't do his role. She didn't do her role. They both fell. Sin, sin entered the world. And I talked just briefly about how complete the corruption of this world was just in the fact that if you read in chapter, we'll actually read the passage in uh, Genesis 2, um, how God created all of plant life for all the animals to eat. And you go, well, big deal. Well, for animals to eat of the fruit and the plants, they have to have certain structures in their mouths to be able to grind that up. You look at a horse's mouth and its teeth and a cow's teeth, they have flat, broad surfaces so that they can grind the fibrous material and, and break it down. They don't have fangs because they don't need them. You don't very often need to defend yourself from grass. Okay? It's not very often that you're going to get attacked by a piece of fruit, unless you're in my family, and then you got to watch because somebody's probably going to chuck it at you. All right? So, even the very nature of creation changed. Okay? God, when he spoke the curse, he told Adam that, that he was going to toil. His work became a four-letter word, and that four-letter word is toil. Okay? Because work itself was not a problem. As a matter of fact, God created man to work. And man works best when he works. Okay? So... The curse wasn't that man would have to work. The curse was that his work would become a toil. And then the, the weeds and the, bristle, uh, the, the thorns, the thistles, all of that stuff came in and, and all of a sudden farming was no fun. Okay. Now for those of you that are farmers here, you know exactly what this means because you've got to do a lot more work now than if before the fall, the, you know, the earth just produced it and your job was to husband it and, and caretake it. Uh, now you've got to fight the thistles and the thorns and, and all of that. So, let's get into Genesis 1. Keep in mind the understanding. Um, I'm going to be giving to you straight out of Scripture, and then I will share what I believe that this is telling us. Okay? And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is going to run contrary to a lot of things that our culture teaches us. Okay? So, let's pray before we start. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. We thank you, Father, that we were not worthy to receive it, and yet you put it here for us to read, that we might know you better, that we might know your heart, that we might know your plan, that we might know your will. But, Father, even beyond that, you have sent your Spirit to indwell us, to give us understanding, to teach us those things that, Father, we would not otherwise be able to understand. I ask, Father, your blessing over the reading of the Word. I ask your blessing over the teaching, Father, that none of the words would fall to the ground, that, Father, nothing of myself would make it out of my mouth, but only what you would have me say. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in chapter 1 of Genesis, and I want to just talk to you real quickly about the creation. So we're in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to pick up down in verse 26. So we're on the sixth day. There have been five days that preceded us. 
We are on the sixth day. Uh, on the sixth day, God spoke and he said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock and the creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. Okay, so God's created all of the animals, all of the insects. Uh, in previous days, he created the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Now he's created all the animals that, that move about the earth, um, you know, like everything like earthworms and giraffes and platypod. What is the plural for platypus? Platypus. Platypus. people. <laughs> I'll have to Google that one. I'm not sure that's right. God, God made all of that. And now, at the end of his creation, in verse 26, he says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Okay, real quick, understand man is not speaking to gender. Man is speaking of mankind. Okay, he's not talking about just Adam here. He's talking about the totality of human creation man and woman, okay? And we'll, we'll get clarification of this in chapter two. So let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth, over every creeping thing uh, that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit you shall have for food. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Okay, so I want to pull a couple things out of here just for us to kind of get lodged into our brains as we go through this study, okay? The first thing, when God says that he wants to create man, the first thing that he says is, let us, okay? Now, in the Hebrew, the word being used here is a plurality, but it's a plurality that consists of three or more, okay? It's, it's not two or more, it's three or more, which is important, okay? Now, most Hebrew scholars, Jewish thinkers, believe that when God is saying this, he's speaking to the angels. Okay? I don't believe this is so, because nowhere else in Scripture do we see that God refers to the angels and himself as us, or we. Okay? I believe that God, right here at the very creation of man, at the outset, he's letting us know about a triune God. Okay? If you want to get into a, a deeper study of this, I would encourage you uh, we have a couple of the copies of the book in the library, uh, Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures by Mino Kalisher. I would really encourage you to read that because Jesus did not just make his appearance in Matthew chapter 2. Okay? He, he's here from Genesis 1. All right? So the first thing we need to understand is God is already letting us know about his triune nature. And then he says, make man in our image. After our likeness. Now this is an image and a likeness of kind, not a duplicate. Okay? We're not when God says this, He's not saying, okay, well, what do we look like? Well, we've got a head with two eyes and a nose with two nostrils and a mouth full of teeth and ears and I would say hair, but that's speculative. <laughs> okay. That's not what God is referring to. I believe what God is talking about is his nature. What makes us different than all the rest of creation? Okay? I think part of that is that we are a tripartite being. We have a body, we have a soul, we have a spirit. I believe animals have bodies and souls. I don't think they have spirits. Okay? 
I, I think that's what is unique um, about us amongst all of creation. You go, well, you know, man is an intellectual creature. <laughs> Very often we prove that to be a lie. I have dogs that show more intellect than I've seen some people in Washington show. Okay? So, um, he's saying, let us make man, man and woman, in our likeness and in our image. Okay? And then he says, and let them have dominion. Now, dominion, somebody give me a definition, a working definition of dominion. To rule over. To rule over. Okay? Okay? Control. Control, absolutely. Care of. Care of, yeah. The, the idea behind this is actually a, a uh, shepherding term. To be the husband of. To be the husband caretaker of. Not to be the one that uh, stands over it in judgment and points and makes... Uh, that, that's God's place. Man's place is to make sure it's taken care of. Okay? To look after and meet its needs. Okay? God didn't put us here to be kings over everything because he's the king. Okay? We're the stewards. We're the caretakers. All right? But, as the caretakers and as the stewards, we are his representative, and he has placed us above all of the rest of creation. Okay? So, he's given us dominion over the fish. You know, I've yet to meet a fish that will acknowledge my dominion. <laughs> Not a one. Over the birds, over the livestock, <laughs> And over every creeping thing. And so he's talked about it. And then he does it. In his own image, he created them male and female. And God blessed them. Now, think about this for a moment. At the moment of creation, God blessed them. We don't really have a good understanding of what blessing is and I, honestly I don't have a good understanding of what blessing is because what is a blessing to me might mean nothing to you okay um, but God at the moment of creation this is the only thing that, that I've seen in creation that God blesses mankind okay he's created them in his image he's made them from the dust of the earth and he blesses them okay and God said to them all right, so here we go. This is the first directive from God to man. Work hard, weed well. <laughs> he says, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it. Now keep in mind, subdue uh, in this context this is not slave drivers with whips and chains. This is a caretaker, making sure that things grow right. Um, I, I don't know a lot about horticulture, but I do know that when you want a fruit tree to bear much fruit, you have to do some pruning. You have to do certain things to, to encourage it to grow well, to produce much fruit. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you have fruit trees of your own uh, and, and, and uh, you want it to produce much food, fruit, you're going to make that thing look gosh awful ugly. Because you've got to trim away a lot of what makes it pretty. Because you want it to produce a lot of fruit. And, and that's kind of what Jesus says about us. Uh, God being the vine dresser, he's got to trim away the bad stuff that we will produce much, much fruit. Okay? So he's taking care of it. He's not smacking it around with whips and chains and, and asserting his authority because all of the authority belongs to God. He's caretaking it, okay? So then it goes on and he says, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay? So now, in this, we have a couple of things that I want to really point out so we understand the basis of what God is going through. The first thing is, God gives man multiple tasks. The first one, be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth. Now, 
this, what, what I'm going to say, I'm going to probably step on toes. I've been, I've been verbally abused for saying this, and, and I, I, firm, I am an absolute firm believer that God desires families that have children. Okay? I think that was his, that right here, this is his original uh, command. Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to judge you. If you decide no kids is for you, or one kid is for you, or two kids is for you, I will tell you this. My personal belief, okay, this is, this is Glenn speaking. This is not the Bible speaking. This is Glenn speaking. What I see the Bible saying is that when you have children, you are blessed. Every example that I see of a woman not having children, it is not a blessing. It's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. As a matter of fact, one of the curses that God gives uh, says that he will put on people is they will not be able to have children. Okay? So I believe the first task that God has given man is to be fruitful and multiply. And people, you know, I hear people all the time, oh, overpopulation. Overpopulation. Look, there, there's a couple things at play here that, that we need to understand. First, we are moving along a timeline that God had instituted eons ago. And none of it's going to move outside of his grasp. None of it's going to move beyond what he has required and dictated that it will be. Okay? I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that it's going to be good. I think in the end, ultimately, it will be for our good. But there's going to be a lot of ugly. There's going to be a lot of bad things happening before we get to the end. But the bad things are not because of God. They're because of sin. Okay? They're because of man's unwillingness to obey God. To be obedient and do the things that he says. All right? So as far as overpopulation, I don't know. Quite honestly, uh, when I go to cities and I see all the traffic and I see all the people, I think, how in the world can these people do this? I get tense. I get edgy. I might even get irritable. And that's just thinking about going there. Okay? I don't believe that God is going to, I don't believe that man has it within its power to overpopulate the earth. Okay? I don't think that man really has it in his ability. Okay? That's not to say that God's not going to use that and make it hard at the end times. I don't know how God's going to do some of the things that he does. You know, if you were to ask me 20 years ago, uh, what it would look like for one-third of all the trees of the earth to be burned up, I tell you, I have no clue. But when I drive from Hamilton to Missoula and I see all the damage that's been done from the fire since 2000, 2001, I start to believe that, that this could be a real thing. Okay? So, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. So the first thing that God tells us is increase and husband. Increase and take care. In increase and steward. Okay? So we're going to jump down here to chapter 2. I've already addressed the vegetation and it's for every all the creation to eat. Um... One other note, 30, verse 31 of chapter 1. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But it's not heaven. So we're going to jump down to uh, chapter 2. Um, there's a, the bulk of chapter 2 is a story of God's creation of man and woman. And I'm just going to draw out a couple things. I'll leave it to you to read this. Um, no, actually I won't. I'm going to read this because I'm going to draw things out as we go and I want you to see what's happening. So we're going to pick up in verse 4. Uh, These are the generations of heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the ground and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the earth. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now, I just want to point something out here real quick. Why do you think God made man out of the dust? I mean, he, he created the dust just by a word. He said, let there be, and there was. So why did he use the creation to create? Here's what I think. I think God used the dust because in some way, shape, or form, man is intrinsically connected to the creation. Okay? Just keep in mind, at the end of all things, the new heaven and the new earth, where will we dwell? The new earth. That will be our place, the new Jerusalem. Somehow or another, and, and God did not reveal this in his word, other than to say that from the dust he created man, and then later he says, and to the dust you will return. God has connected man to this creation. Okay? We'll see later in the chapter, all the animals were also created out of the earth. God breathed life into them. But there's one creation that is unique uh, of, of all of the animals, and we'll also see that a little bit later. <clears throat> okay, so. Verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then it talks about the river coming out and the, the four rivers. And uh, I believe that when the flood came, uh, Eden that was, uh, was removed. Because the, the four rivers that they talk about flowing out from the garden are in no wise connected today. Okay. Um, okay, and then we'll jump down to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of the tr every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Now, God has created the, the entire earth, the planet, and he took man, whom he said he would make in his image, that he might rule and that he might have dominion, and he puts him in this garden. Okay? Now, in the garden... There were trees and fruits and things of various kinds. But there's only two that we get, are given the name of. There's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? And it says, God spoke to the man and said, you can eat of any of the trees except this one. Which by implication means what? What about that other tree? You can't touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but what about the tree of life? Could Adam eat from the, not the, the tree of life? I, I think he could. I think that was God's intent. I think God's intention was not that man would grow old and die. Now, I don't know how it works because God doesn't give us a lot of information as to how he planned on it working because, unfortunately, in chapter 3, sin came in and everything got off track. Okay? But God places him in this garden and he says, one rule, don't eat that. Okay? Verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heaven and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam... There was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh, and the rib that God, the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay? 
So, in all of creation, up to this point, we have seen creation just by the spoken word of God. He said, let it be, and it was. We have seen creation where God divinely created out of the dust of the earth, and, and he drew out of the earth uh, all of the animals, all the trees, all the birds, uh, and, and then he fashioned man out of the dust. But in all of creation, there's only one that stands unique, and that's a creation of woman. God took a rib from man, a part of him, and created from that woman. Okay? Now, before we go on, you know, something that really needs to be addressed uh, in the church, there are so many people that believe this to be a fanciful tale. They believe this to be uh, kind of uh, Christian and Jewish mythology. It's not mythology, it's history. Okay? God put it down so we would understand how things came to be. I think he put it down so we would understand how things came to be, so we would understand the relative difference between us and God. That we would see that he's the creator and we are the creation, and that in no wise are we equal to God. Okay? So he lays these things out. Why he didn't give us more detail as to how exactly these things fell into place and where in this whole timeline uh, was, was Eve created for Adam? Was it day 6? Was it day 14? We don't, we don't get that. It's not given to us to know that. What's given to us to know is that she is unique among all creation and she was given a purpose just as man was given a purpose, mankind was given a purpose when God said that he would create them so that they would rule over and take care of all that God had created. Woman has a purpose and what is that? Oh, don't whisper, just say it. Be a helper. Well, definitely, to be a helper, but without her, they would not be able to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, how does a helper work? I don't know. I, I, honestly, I don't know. I think God waited until Adam named all of the animals, because if he didn't, he would have been saying, no, that's not a good name. Because, see, that's how it worked in our family. When we had children... I wrote down a list of the names that I wanted. And Christy crossed them all off and gave me the list of the names that she wanted, of which I went through and selected the ones that I was okay with. Okay? And, and can you imagine if that went on with all of creation? Well, oh, let's see. I'm going to call this a Fahubagats. Adam, nobody... I'm not telling my children that that's a Fahuba gap. <laughs> really? We're going to call that a lion. Okay? Just, just lion. Okay? And I, I think that's why she came after. Because God knew it was going to, you know, right at creation there would be problems. Okay? But the, I'm, I'm kidding. Because that's not really what would have happened. That's not what God's heart was. I, I believe what happened was that man in going about his business, it wasn't whether or not he could do it on his own. If he couldn't do it on his own, God wouldn't have created him alone. He, he could have fulfilled it by himself with no problem. But God said it's not good for him to be alone. Okay? And so he created for him a helper to help him do those things that God had given him. Those things are being fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, to have dominion and to rule and to steward and to take care of all of creation. Okay? So from this story, we can draw out a couple of things. Okay? First, when God created man and woman, he created man and woman. Okay? When God instituted that unique and special blessed relationship of a husband and a wife, he created a man and a woman. Okay? Why? Why didn't God create a man and a man? Or a woman and a woman? Yeah, very simple. They can't do what he is requiring them to do. Be fruitful and multiply. Okay? Now, this brings up an issue that um, I don't speak about a lot in the church, and I intentionally don't speak about it a lot in the church, because it seems like so much of the church spends too much time talking about it. Okay? What is the deal with homosexuality? Quite simply, it's sin. Okay? 
Um, it, it's not how God intended the creation to work. We see that in Genesis 1 and 2. We want further instruction when God gave the Hebrews the law. He says that this is not what I desire. This is not my intent. This should not be. Okay? It's a sin. Okay? Now, we can rationalize, we can reason, we can argue, we can debate. We can do all of those things before God, but because he's the creator, because he is the God, because he is the king and there are no others, it's his rules. It's quite simply that simple. Okay? Now, the church spends a lot of time coming down on homosexuality and, and coming down on, on the people that are caught in this sin, or on the other hand, the church just warmly embraces them and never tells them that what they're doing is wrong. Both of these are wrong in that when we speak the truth, we speak the truth in love, and the intention of speaking the truth in love is to seek to restore. Okay? But if we're not speaking the truth in love, we're just loving without the truth, uh, we, are, we are greasing the slope for their slippery slide. Okay? And we will be held accountable for that. Okay? When we stand before God, if all we can do is tell him, hey, well, we told the truth, and he's going to say, where was the love? Or if we stand before God and we say, hey, man, I loved him, and he's going to say, where was the truth? <laughs> okay? Now, you say, okay, but that's Old Testament. That's, that's stuff, you know, God needed the people, uh, you know, the whole multiply and fill. He, he couldn't have them shacking up male and male and female and female and, and working like that because it wouldn't work. Uh, that, you know, he's God. If he wanted that to work, he could have done it so biologically it could work. He chose not to. Okay? He chose not to. All right? Now, in the New Testament, we have at least two... Uh, well, three references, Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 6. Uh, there's one other writing I can't recall offhand that speak specifically to the issue of homosexual sin. Okay? We know in Romans 1 that we see that the downward spiral of moral depravity, where man starts off in a right relationship with God, and then through a series of decisions, he ends up rejecting God and, and ultimately ends up worshiping himself and the creation, we see that at the end of that, God gives them over to the sin. There's a point where God will just say, you know what, I'm taking my hands off, go for it. Trust me, you do not want to be in that place. Okay? As a result of getting to that place, God will give a society over to sexual sin. And that sexual sin, as relayed in, in Romans chapter 1, is homosexual love. Okay? Now, can, can two homosexuals love each other? Absolutely, I believe they can. Whether they be male, whether they be female, I believe they can love each other. I don't think the love is the issue. I believe it's the dynamic of the relationship that's the issue. Okay? Because God said, that's not what I want. This is what I want. Now, we see in, uh, like I said, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 6, we see that Paul gives a list of those who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And in that list, he says homosexuals. Okay? But that is one out of a list of many. Do you hear what I'm saying? Homosexuality <laughs> is one sin among many. So when we deal with people that are caught up in the sin of homosexuality, we need to deal with them from the standpoint that we ourselves were caught up in sin. And that we still... Fight the battle of sin every day. Okay? That some, of the, some of the sins in my life are not easy to overcome. And i got to fight them every day, every day, every day. So we need to deal with them from the standpoint that we were sinners whom God has saved and redeemed because of his grace. And we need to approach them from that place that God loves them so much that he wants better for them than they can even understand or appreciate for themselves. Okay? So as a church, do we stand in opposition to homosexuality? Well, yeah, we do. We stand in opposition to all sin. We stand in opposition to gossip. We stand in opposition to lying. 
why is it so easy for us to point out the homosexuality and not deal with the others? You, you look at, the, at something, no, I won't even go there. I'm not even going to go there. Here's, here's the issue. Here's the root of it all. It's sin because God said it was sin. Not because I said it was sin. Not because uh, some TV minister or evangelist said it was sin. It's sin because God says so. It's part and parcel of the fallen nature of man. Okay? And that's, just, that's just something that comes along with it. Some, I mean, I know um, the, the idea of homosexuality is incredibly distasteful for some. And they go, ooh. Okay? But you know what? You have sins of your own that other people are going, ooh. Okay? So when, when dealing with the issue of homosexuality, you need to understand, yes, it is sin. Two, Christ died for those sinners. Inasmuch as he died for me, he died for them. Okay? God detested every one of my sins every bit as much as he detests homosexuality. Amen. I, don't, I don't have a, an exalted place. The only place that I've got is that I'm saved by his grace. I've been, been redeemed because of his grace, because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that same blood was shed for every sin, no matter how distasteful. Okay? So... In creation, we see that God created man and woman, singular man, singular woman. Not multiple men to one woman or multiple women to one man. It's, it's interesting to note uh, when Moses was bringing the children of Israel up to the promised land, God spoke to him and told him that, that they were going to want a king. And that these are the rules that should govern the king. And one of the rules that he laid out was that they should be the husband of but one wife. One wife. Okay? That's something that God implemented in a, a uh, polygamous society where if you could afford more women, you got as many women as you could afford. Okay? So, so God intended from creation one man, one woman. There is a uniqueness to that bond that should never be shared with somebody else. One man, one woman. Now, I don't believe that, that in this world that there is one woman for one man and that, um, you know, Thaddeus, there is one woman out there that Thaddeus has to find. But at the same time, I believe that God knows the one woman that he will find. And then when they say, I do, there will only ever be and should only ever be one woman and one man in that relationship. Till death do you part. Okay? That's how God designed it. That's how God intended it to work. One man, one woman. Together. Becoming one flesh. Now, uh, you know, I don't know how God views the one flesh thing. I mean, when I picture one flesh, I see this hemoglobin thing of, of just melted and, and if that's not how it's intended but once you put them together you cannot easily take them apart and I don't think, I, I think God intentionally did that because he didn't want it to be easy to take them apart because when you've been together with someone a part of you is in them and a part of them is in you okay so God created one woman, one man God intended for that to be the, the natural state of relationship to fulfill the command that he had given them, to be fruitful and multiply, okay? And I, well, you know, if one woman is good, then two women should be better because then you can have lots more multiplication. And, and as a matter of fact, if you have 10 wives, then you can increase exponentially. And, and then the math gets really crazy. And we, no, that's not how God intended it to work. If he intended that to work, it would have been Adam and Eve and Sarah and Susie and Barbara, and, and, and he didn't do that, did he? Okay? So, in the creation, we see the purpose of man was given that he would be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and that he would have dominion or stewardship or care of all that God had created. That woman was created from man, unique in all of creation. She was created to be a helper to man so that he might be able to accomplish the tasks that God had given them. That they would work together to accomplish these things. Okay? 
And as we get into more about a family affair and how these relationships work and the dynamic behind these things and the understanding that Scripture gives us of these things, we're going to see that our, our society really has very little in common with what God intends for, for the family relationships to look like.